Great, thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, welcome to everyone who is here this morning. Really appreciate you showing up. I know that with the holiday season, the upcoming new year, um, there are a lot of things going on. There are a lot of other things that you could be spending your time with. And so I do appreciate uh, your attendance at today's lecture. And so without further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just like uh, Jeff said, my presentation today is going to be on uh, the major space law events of the year 2021. So this past year, very exciting. Um, so we'll discuss things of comparatively minor importance and of course, comparatively major importance as well. Um, Jeff already provided you with a bit of a brief introduction, but uh, who am I? Well, some of you know me because you have been uh, attending these lit work webinars for the past uh, several months or perhaps even the past year. Uh, but I am Major Jeremy Grunert. I'm a United States Air Force JAG officer. I've been serving with the Air Force for uh, about eight years, uh, mostly as a base level prosecutor for the standard Air Force JAG legal offices. So much of my career has been spent, you know, prosecuting court martials, uh, doing other um, typical JAG things, working in the civil law arena, legal assistance, etc. I've been stationed overseas several times in both Turkey and the United Kingdom uh, and deployed to Afghanistan and Qatar. Uh, and as Jeff said, I was sent to the University of Mississippi School of Law in the 2019-2020 school year to obtain an Air and Space Law LLM uh, to prepare me to come to the U.S. Air Force Academy, uh, where I currently teach the space law course, uh, which has been developed here in the last couple of years. Um, I'll kick off with kind of the standard disclaimer, uh, right? Despite my uh, position as a JAG officer, uh, my role here at the Academy, none of my comments uh, or any of the information described in this presentation should be construed as the official position of the US government, uh, the DOD, or the Department of the Air Force. Um, nor should my comments be interpreted as any official statement or interpretation of US government or agency policy, um, unless, for example, I was quoting directly, uh, you know, from, uh, for instance, the President of the United States or a presidential national space policy or some such. Um, but thank you for that. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So my objectives for today's presentation are essentially, like I said, a year in review. We're gonna review some key international events uh, and United Nations actions uh, from the past year related to international space law. And we're also gonna review a number of law and policy decisions um, from here in the United States that have taken place in the last year that will ultimately contribute to developments in possibly US national space law, but possibly also international law as well. And it should likely come as no surprise uh, to people who are following the events of space law that there's been kind of a consistent theme, really not just over the past year, but perhaps even the past couple of years, but certainly in 2021, the consistent theme and influence um, in the space law domain has been on responsible behavior in outer space. You've probably heard this term repeated many times over, as you can see from some of the graphics uh, here on the slide. This has been a very critical issue um, that has been discussed there at the United Nations. Uh, UNUSA um, sponsored a series of webinars on this very topic and a number of you know, key uh, non-governmental organizations such as the RAND Corporation, uh, Chatham House, have also been working on this and it's been a key topic as we will see in many of the years, most critical space law events. Now, the legal underpinning to this idea of responsible behavior is largely drawn from the Outer Space Treaties, Article 9. Right? And I've thrown up the text of Article 9 uh, just on these next two slides. Um, no real reason for me to necessarily read that text out to you uh, verbatim, but some of the key portions of Article 9 that come into play with this idea of responsible behavior um, can be seen kind of highlighted in bold on these slides, right? Principles of cooperation and mutual assistance. How do states relate to each other in their activities in the outer space domain? This concept of due regard, 
what does it mean? What does it mean for states uh, to operate with due regard to one another in the outer space domain? And how does that look in practice? Article nine mentions avoiding harmful contamination of the space environment. Um, largely in recent years, uh, this has come to uh, encompass the concept of orbital debris and the risks that such debris poses to space operations as a whole for all states. Um, moving on into later portions of the article, the idea of harmful interference, right? Harmful interference, which could potentially uh, come into play through such things as orbital debris and that contamination of the space environment, or it could be either unintentional or intentional harmful interference uh, by one state to the space systems of another state. And so these concepts that are mentioned in Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, these ideas of acting with due regard, avoiding harmful interference, making sure that if there is activity that would cause potentially harmful interference that other states are aware of those things and can take steps to reduce their risk uh, of harm, these all play a very, very critical role in this concept of responsible behavior as it continues to develop at the international level. Now with that kind of introduction to Kind of the underpinnings of the idea of responsible behavior. Let's move on into some actual critical space events that have occurred in the year 2021. Now here in the United States, uh, obviously at the beginning of the year, we had the change of presidential administrations, right? Uh, the outgoing Trump administration gave way to the Biden administration. President uh, Joe Biden was inaugurated on January 20th uh, and his administration took over. Uh, you know, the United States government, and largely the space policies of the previous administration. Um, despite, you know, some initial rocky questions at press conferences uh, and whatnot um, with uh, President Biden's press secretary, um, very quickly uh, it became apparent that items from the previous administration, such as the United States Space Force, had the full backing of the Biden administration. Um, the Space Force has continued to expand over the course of 2021, uh, and you know, despite perhaps some perceptions uh, in certain political areas in the United States uh, that the Space Force was kind of simply a vanity project of the Trump administration, uh, the Biden administration has continued on with full support of the Space Force, um, and it continues, as I said, to grow and expand and to become um, the new service, right, that had kind of been foreseen in some of the initial planning uh, that took place over the 2020 year uh, after the initial creation of the Space Force in 2019. In addition to continued support for the Space Force, um, the Biden administration has also continued to support other Trump administration policies, including the resurrection of the National Space Council, uh, which we'll return to kind of near the end of this presentation and the continuation of the Artemis program, the program that was put together to return US astronauts to the moon um, that has continued to be supported by the Biden administration um, and NASA. So interestingly, while I think it's apparent to, to most that there are radical differences between um, right, President Trump's and President Biden's approaches to many political issues, at least in the subject area of space and space policy, the two administrations are much closer together um, than they are different, uh, which is kind of a common theme that we'll continue to explore as we move through this presentation. Now, after the change of presidential administration in January, um, there were a couple of articles uh, coming out in February of this year um, with respect to continued U.S. support for rules of responsible behavior. Okay. One example is uh, this, this article from February 24th from Space News that you see a picture of here on the slide. Um, but overarchingly, there was a continuation again in the new administration of the policies and kind of international um, 
policy arrangements and policy support that the previous administration had given to this development of rules of responsible behavior. So the United States had worked with the United Kingdom on uh, a previous resolution that the UK had sponsored in the UN uh, and which had been passed late last year in December of 2020. Um, involving this concept of developing rules of responsible behavior. And we'll talk about the report that resulted from that resolution shortly. Um, but again, as we entered the new year, as we rolled into January and February, uh, the American Diplomatic Corps, the US military continued to voice its support for the development of these norms or rules of responsible behavior. And you saw this continued emphasis on responsibility. Responsibility, a very key concept that you saw originally um, kind of being developed in American space policy documents during the Obama administration, especially. The concept of responsibility played a very, very key role in President Obama's national space policy that was released in 2010. Um, emphasis on responsibility was echoed, not just in the Trump administration's support for things like the UK resolution uh, in the UN, but also in the Trump administration's national space policy, uh, which was also released last December, kind of in the closing um, days of the Trump presidency. So you have this continued emphasis on responsible behavior, the development of norms, the development of rules that the United States, uh, and indeed, Western allies of the United States, uh, particularly the UK, which has sponsored these resolutions in the UN, um, continue to foster. On a slightly less serious note, um, kind of moving deeper into the year, uh, April saw the kind of joking announcement by uh, Elon Musk, right, the CEO of SpaceX, uh, that he was the imperator of Mars, right? In reference to his desire to right, use his SpaceX rockets to eventually colonize Mars, uh, Mr. Musk uh, changed his Twitter status to declare himself the Imperator of Mars, um, which was widely mocked and ridiculed in the press, portrayed as kind of an eccentric outburst um, by Musk, who had a number of such outbursts kind of over the past several years. And again, while not very serious, it does raise uh, some implications for international space law principles. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Outer Space Treaty, obviously Article 2 prohibits national appropriation of um, outer space or celestial bodies. So the idea that Mars could be colonized in, in the way that um, colonization had worked uh, in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s is something that is very much contrary to um, current existing principles of international outer space law. Um, this also, of course, implicates Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which stipulates that governments bear international responsibility, not just for their governmental space activities, but also for the space activities of non-governmental entities, which includes commercial entities such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, et cetera. And that these activities require continuing authorization and supervision by the government um, in the country from which they operate. And so this idea that Elon Musk could be the imperator or emperor of Mars um, is one that, again, while a joke by Mr. Musk um, does raise some interesting questions because um, certainly in my space law class, people were curious about it. Uh, and so we had to discuss the idea, right? That international treaties such as the Outer Space Treaty will apply to commercial space activities no less than they will apply to governments. Also in April, uh, not to toot our own horn, overly much, um, but the Law, Technology, and Warfare Research Cell partnered with uh, U.S. Space Command to sponsor and host uh, the very first U.S. Spacecom legal conference. Um, as Jeff said at the beginning of this talk, uh, this U.S. Spacecom legal conference uh, is intended to be an annual event from here on out um, and will occur again um, this coming April in 2022, and I'll speak about that a bit later. But the inaugural US Spacecom Legal Conference was a very, very impressive um, 
event, which I think allowed us to examine some very critical issues uh, of international and national space law in a variety of ways. Uh, we had a number of keynote presentations from uh, senior ranking members of US Space Command itself, uh, Rear Admiral Mike Bernanke, the Director of Strategy Plans and Policy uh, for Space Command, Brigadier General Troy Indicott and Captain Robert Passarello of the National Security Council um, presented a keynote. And of course, Dr. Franz von der Dunk um, of Nebraska University College of Law, uh, internationally renowned space law expert and author of multiple textbooks on the subject. So we had a wide, wide range of very intelligent, very knowledgeable people um, discussing both US military uh, space policy, uh, US space policy generally, the key underpinnings uh, of international space law. And we also examined a number of things, uh, including commercial space law uh, through panels on commercial activity, the space law activities of US international partners, uh, such as Germany and the United Kingdom um, in an international panel that we conducted and again, it was a very, very interesting conference, which we intend to host annually to discuss these critical space law issues and to kind of broaden both kind of the militaries and the public's understanding of these critical space law issues. Now, moving into May, we began to see some additional kind of international incidents that seem to implicate concepts of space law. And again, particularly concepts of responsible behavior uh, and the way in which countries ought to interact with one another, perhaps not just on orbit, but also with respect to how space operations can affect people and things on the ground. And so in May, you had this incident involving the People's Republic of China launching their core module for their Tengong space station uh, kind of at the end of the month. So April 28th, PRC launches the core module. And over the next couple of days after the kind of first stage of the rocket body released uh, its payload into orbit, the rocket body was going to re-enter Earth's atmosphere somewhere, right? It was a question. Nobody knew quite exactly where it was being tracked, but it was an uncontrolled rocket body that, as was widely reported, could potentially have impacted a number of places um, and a number of populated areas on the ground when it re-entered Earth's atmosphere. And so there was a lot of kerfuffle uh, on Twitter, um, certain Western news agencies reporting on this rocket body incident. And you had, of course, uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson coming out with uh, a statement on the matter, again, emphasizing issues of responsibility, responsible standards, safety, and the like, right? So here's part of his statement here. Spacefaring nations must minimize the risks to people and property on Earth of re-entries of space objects, maximize transparency regarding those operations. He accused China of failing to meet responsible standards regarding space debris, and stated that it was critical that not just China, but all spacefaring nations and commercial entities act responsibly and transparently, transparently in space to ensure the safety, stability, security, and long-term sustainability of space activities. All of these terms, right? Safety, stability, security, long-term sustainability. These are all keywords, catchphrases that tie in overarchingly to the concept of responsible behavior in outer space, which of course, um, Administrator Nelson mentioned extensively throughout this incident, this idea that perhaps the use of an uncontrolled rocket body that would fall back to Earth is an irresponsible behavior. Now, of course, the use of such a rocket body up until recently was standard for just about all space launches. So, here you see perhaps not just um, an emphasis right on this idea of responsibility, 
but even changing norms and standards as to what responsibility means. If you have the technology to develop a rocket body, such as those developed by SpaceX and Blue Origin, that can make a controlled re-entry uh, to the Earth's atmosphere and perhaps even be reusable, is the use of an uncontrolled rocket body therefore a violation of your standard of due care, of due regard, of responsible behavior? It's a very interesting question. But in addition to this idea of responsible behavior, which as we've seen is so critical, this incident involving uh, right, the Chinese uh, Long March rocket body also implicates a number of other things. Right? Again, we can bring in Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, that idea that state parties to the treaty bear international responsibility uh, for their activities in space. Right? Had the rocket body impacted another state, um, the People's Republic of China could have potentially borne some sort of international responsibility for um, damage caused. Also, of course, Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention, the liability um, provisions of international space law. Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty, of course, um, built upon in the Liability Convention. The text of Article 7 is here. The concept that state parties will be internationally liable for damage to another state party uh, to the treaty on the basis of damage that is caused by launches, space objects, et cetera, right? And the Liability Convention goes on to explain that damage to objects, people, et cetera, on the earth itself, right, terrestrially or in the air uh, is a strict liability matter, right? As opposed to on orbit damage, um, which is going to be based largely on comparative fault, right? It's gonna be a fault-based liability system. But as outer space operations continue to expand, as more and more nations are launching more and more rockets, this idea of the re-entry of orbital debris, whether it be rocket bodies, whether it be satellites themselves or other space objects, is likely to become much more of an issue, right? Article 7, the liability convention have not been frequently used, right? There have only been a comparatively small number of incidents in which the liability convention has actually been used to recover damages from the state. It's likely though that with increased space activity, the liability convention could come into play much more frequently. And in addition, right, this idea of what constitutes responsible behavior, what constitutes due regard is going to be one that continues to be examined and debated and developed. Now in July, again, building on this theme of responsible behavior, the United States Department of Defense actually released a memo, right, a memo from the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, entitled The Tenets of Responsible Behavior in Space. Very first uh, official DOD memo of its kind, actually developing ideas, tenets, principles of responsible behavior for how the Department of Defense itself seeks to operate in outer space. And so again, you can see, right, as you read through this memo, very, very short, right? The entire memo itself is here on the page. It's just a one page document. This memo builds on the previous national space policies of both the Obama and the Trump administrations, as well as uh, the Obama administration's 2011 national security space strategy to articulate these tenets of responsible behavior uh, that the DOD believes are critical for preserving the space environment and for encouraging the responsible use of space. And I know that they might've been hard to read on the picture of the memo that was included on the previous slide. And so here are the five, right? The five tenants uh, misspelled in the title of this slide, apparently, sorry, uh, are not tenants, tenants, operating in, from, to, and through space with due regard to others and in a professional manner, right? So again, that due regard concept drawn straight out of Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. 
Number two, limiting the generation of long-lived debris. Long-lived space debris, um, we have seen the harmful effects of space debris uh, in damage to satellites, right? We've had collisions of defunct satellites that have resulted in damage or destruction of active satellites. And again, a concept that's largely drawn from Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, the preservation and avoidance of contamination of the space environment. Number three, avoiding the creation of harmful interference. Again, harmful interference, that term drawn directly from Article 9, the DOD seeking to avoid harmful interference with other states operating in outer space. Number four, maintaining safe separation and safe trajectory. This idea that there should be a safe distance of sorts right between space objects in order to prevent harmful collisions, harmful interference, the creation of long-lived debris. You can see how all of these tenets build into one another. Number five, communicating and making notifications to enhance the safety and stability of the domain. While the language is somewhat different, right, you can see that this too relates to Article 9 and the responsibility of states um, that have some sort of knowledge of potential harmful interference, uh, either to themselves or to another state, um, to make representations to communicate the risk of that harm to others. Okay. So not necessarily brand new ideas here in the DOD tenets, tenets of responsible behavior, but ones that being recognized by the Department of Defense show that the, these concepts of due regard, harmful interference, preserving the space environment are beginning to become more and more significant, not just to the Department of Defense, but to the United States government as a whole, and indeed to the international community as a whole. And speaking of the international community, right? I mentioned earlier the UK-sponsored UN resolution that was passed in December of 2020. That resolution, right, which was uh, Resolution 7536, um, encouraged members of the United Nations to study existing and potential security risks and threats in space, and to characterize actions and activities that could be considered responsible or irresponsible or threatening um, with respect to their potential impact on international security. The resolution also encouraged states to share their ideas on the development and implementation of norms, rules, and principles of responsible behavior. And so what ultimately happened uh, with respect to the UK's Resolution 7536 was that this call to UN member states to share their ideas on the development of norms, rules for responsible behavior, led to a wide range of responses from a fairly significant number of states, uh, which were studied, organized, and drafted up into this report uh, that was called for in the resolution. And the report was published, as you can see there on the slide, on the 13th of July of this year. And it's a very, very interesting report. Uh, and if you go to the United Nations website um, and take a look uh, at, at the page uh, devoted to this report, you can also read the full responses of each state uh, that submitted a response um, to Resolution 7536's call for, for comments. Um, but again, the report is very, very interesting. Um, it doesn't necessarily say a ton that um, folks who are familiar with outer space law and outer space policy don't necessarily already know, right? As you can see the quotes uh, here on the slide um, from the report's concluding section, that outer space is increasingly devolving into an arena for strategic competition, terrestrial geopolitical rivalry, rivalries are being reproduced in Earth orbit and beyond. Again, that's something that I think most um, people following 
space law, space policy um, can see for themselves. But the report does come out and discuss the idea that possible solutions to these problems, right, could potentially involve the development of new norms, new rules, new principles, right? And again, largely devoted to establishing and developing rules of responsible behavior, right? But a general recognition that the current legal framework for outer space is not sufficient to prevent some of the negative trends that we've seen in outer space, including strategic competition, including um, possible space arms races uh, with respect to either on orbit weapons or anti-satellite weapons, the continued development of fields of space debris, et cetera, right? And so there is a general recognition at the international level that something should likely change, right? If these problems are to be addressed and that solution, right, could involve either binding or voluntary norms, rules, or principles devoted to concepts of responsible behavior. And building on this, the United, the United Kingdom, again, sponsored a resolution at the UN. Um, uh, it has made its way through the first committee, uh, has not yet been, uh, I think, wholly approved by the General Assembly, but I believe we might be able to expect news on that any time, right? This is resolution uh, AC176L52, um, which passed the UN First Committee in November. Um, the US backed the UK uh, in its sponsorship of this resolution. And again, it ultimately passed the First Committee with uh, only a small number of um, no votes or abstentions. And kind of the key portion of this resolution is the convention of one of the United Nations open-ended working groups um, beginning next year, right in 2022, to examine the international legal order for outer space law um, and the normative frameworks that relate to state behavior with respect to outer space um, to consider, as it says here, right, the current and future threats um, by states to space systems, um, the actions, activities, and omissions of states that could be considered irresponsible. And ultimately, right, the purpose of this open-ended working group is to make recommendations on the new development of norms, rules, principles of responsible behavior that could address such threats to space systems. Now you can see here in the language of subsection C uh, here on the slide that the resolution at least contemplates uh, potentially legally binding instruments, right? Perhaps a new space treaty of some kind um, to supplement the four existing, uh, you know, widely subscribed to space treaties, not including the Moon Agreement. Uh, whether or not this would actually come to pass, uh, we will have to see, obviously. Um, but again, it does seem that there is a wider and wider international acceptance that something must be done to address state behavior in outer space and to ensure that the outer space environment uh, is used responsibly. Now, shortly after the passage of the UK's UN resolution there at the first committee, um, you saw a new outer space related event uh, which caught the world's attention and which, for obvious reasons, implicates um, some critical issues of outer space law, including the responsible behavior principles that we've been discussing um, for a large portion of this presentation. And this event occurred uh, in the middle of the month, um, November 15th, when Russia conducted uh, an ASAT test of its 
fairly new ground-based Nudal missile system um, to target a defunct Soviet satellite, Cosmos 1408. Um, the test was successful. Um, the Earth launched ASAT missile, impacted Cosmos 1408, um, destroying the satellite and creating what was estimated to be um, over 1,500 new pieces of space debris in low Earth orbit. Um, you saw a number of articles come out in the days after the test, um, and you saw the test criticized by uh, a number of countries uh, and a number of key diplomats um, from those countries, including U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, whose statement on the incident um, is partially uh, recreated here on the slide. And again, what you can see is an emphasis on responsibility and responsible behavior, right? The long-lived debris created by this dangerous and irresponsible test will threaten satellites and space objects, vital to all nations, security, economic, and scientific interests, right? The safety and security of all actors seeking to explore and use outer space for peaceful purposes has been carelessly endangered. Accuses Russia of being willing to jeopardize the long-term sustainability of outer space to imperil the exploration and use of outer space by all nations. All of these things, again, these this terminology relates directly to concepts of responsible behavior and again can be drawn back to Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. And so again, uh, right, you have these, these same issues creeping up again and again, um, whether it be irresponsible versus responsible, um, whether certain activities are likely to create outer space debris or threaten the sustainability of the outer space environment. Very, very critical ideas and concepts, right? And obviously this isn't the first ASAT test uh, that has occurred um, over the past 15 years, right? Uh, this Russian ASAT test is only the most recent. India tested a direct descent ASAT in uh, 2018. China tested a direct descent ASAT in 2007. Um, both of those tests also obviously resulted in space debris um, and the creation of debris fields, although the Chinese test of 2007 um, generally recognized as one of the most significant debris creating events um, certainly over the last several decades. So this, again, concept of responsible behavior and what it means to operate in space responsibly is one that continues to be drawn to the fore. And it's a little unclear as to exactly uh, why the Russian Federation conducted the anti-satellite test. Um, could perhaps have just been a test of their ASAT system um, there could be other reasons, um, perhaps to put pressure on other international actors to um, come around to support of previous Russian um, proposals with respect to outer space arms control. Um, again, a little unclear. But the ultimate result of the test, not just the creation of this 1500 plus um, object debris field, um, but also wide condemnation and even strangely enough, um, some displeased rumblings from other segments of the Russian uh, outer space program, right? The head of Roscosmos uh, just recently spoke out against the, the test uh, in, in November. So very, very interesting, right? That the Russians chose to do this but again, it's not just responsible behavior that the test implicates. There are other things related to international space law that come into play as well. Article four of the Outer Space Treaty uh, is of course the kind of arms control provision of, of that treaty. Uh, the text is here on the screen. States party to the treaty undertake not to place an orbit around the earth for the objects carrying nuclear weapons 
or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, install such weapons on celestial bodies or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. Now, as a wide range of international space law experts and commentators have pointed out, conventional weapons are not prohibited by Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty, and nor are ground to space weapons, uh, such as the ASAT missile that was launched um, by Russia in November, okay? not prohibited by Article 4. Now, there have been attempts in the past, both kind of the extended past and the recent past, to develop new international frameworks to govern ASAP missiles, right? Um, during the late 1970s, during the Carter administration, there was at least an initial push by the Carter administration to develop a new space law treaty at the international level with the Soviet Union to restrict uh, ASAT testing and the development of ASAT missiles. Um, despite some perhaps initial successes, the effort ultimately went nowhere and was abandoned entirely after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, and more recently, China and Russia have proposed at uh, the United Nations uh, the draft treaty on prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space uh, and of the threat or use of force against outer space objects, right, which is kind of more commonly referred to as the PPWT or the Prevention of Placement of Weapons in Outer Space Treaty. The United States uh, and a number of other kind of Western states have not really subscribed to the PPWT, um, a, hence it's not really going anywhere at the UN, um, largely because the original text of the treaty did not encompass uh, ASAT weapons. Uh, and despite kind of some amendments to the treaty text um, made by uh, China and Russia uh, over the course of several years, the United States and you know the, the same Western nations that at least initially opposed the treaty uh, have never really gotten back on board. Um, so while the Russian ASAT test may uh, implicate or possibly even violate provisions of international space law with respect to these ideas of the creation of long-lived space debris, um, perhaps being a violation of the due regard principle, et cetera, all of those things that come into play with concepts of responsible behavior, it does not violate any sort of weapons testing or arms control provision of international space law. Okay? Uh, and again, this is something that um, many space law academics and commentators and space policy uh, academics have, have been highly critical of in the past. The fact that the international space law framework as it currently exists does not provide mechanisms to prevent this sort of kind of military activity in space uh, or perhaps this sort of space um, arms race uh, type problem. Now, earlier in this presentation, I mentioned uh, President Biden's continued support for the National Space Council, uh, which was resurrected during the Trump administration. Uh, the National Space Council kind of originally created in the early 1990s, um, but really didn't meet at all during the Bush or Obama administrations. Um, and again, as I said, was not resurrected until um, the Trump administration when President Trump did so via executive order. But the Biden administration uh, held its first meeting of the National Space Council earlier this month on the 1st of December. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, right here in the photo, uh, chaired the National Space Council uh, meeting. Uh, the, the Vice President is traditionally the chair of the National Space Council. Um, she did so kind of in the wake of an executive order issued the same day uh, by President Biden that expanded the membership of the National Space Council as well. And one of the key things that was discussed during the council meeting was, again, this concept of responsible behavior. Vice President Harris um, quoted here, without clear norms for the responsible use of space, we stand the real risk of threats to our national and global security. Right? one of the key topics of the National Space Council talk at the beginning of the month. And this was followed the following day 
by the release of a new uh, document from the White House, the United States Space Priorities Framework. So the Biden administration has not yet released its own national space policy, uh, which really is not overly surprising. Most presidential administration's national space policies don't come um, you know, until several years into their administration, or in the case of the Trump administration, really in the waning days um, of, of the administration. But the Biden administration has released the space policy or the space priorities framework. And among these priorities, right, there's kind of two key areas of priority that the framework mentions. And the first is maintaining a robust and responsible US space enterprise, which involves a number of points uh, which are listed here on the screen and which are obviously explored in more depth uh, in the framework itself. So first, that the United States will maintain its leadership in space exploration and space science, right? Critical part of maintaining a robust and responsible US space enterprise. Secondly, that the US will advance the development and use of space-based Earth observation capabilities that support action on climate change. Right? Climate change, um, a critical uh, policy focus of the Biden administration, likely not surprising um, that there is an emphasis in this space priorities framework on the use of remote sensing and space-based Earth observation to support action on that policy. The U.S. will foster a policy and a regulatory environment that enables a competitive and burgeoning U.S. commercial space sector, right? Building on um, expansions in commercial national space law um, over the course of the second Bush administration and especially, right, the Obama administration. Um, key emphasis on the U.S. commercial space sector and the further development of space enterprises, right, such as SpaceX. Um, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and a wide, wide range of other space enterprises. That the US will protect space related critical infrastructure, strengthen the security of the US space industrial base, uh, that we will defend uh, the national security interests of the United States from uh, the growing scope and scale of space and counter space threats. And again, that the US will invest in the next generation through education in you know, science and technology. Um, an emphasis on space-based affairs, computing, network issues, et cetera. The second major policy uh, priority area is preserving space for current and future generations. Again, kind of an emphasis on the space environment itself and the continued ability of mankind to use outer space um, for its own purposes, right? So the US will lead in strengthening global governance of space activities. A very, very, you know, kind of critical and interesting um, policy priority, which emphasizes the development kind of of US um, kind of opinions uh, of international space law and space governance over the years, right? In the early, uh, 21st century, right during the second Bush administration, very, very little interest by the Bush administration in continuing to develop the international framework of outer space, right? If you look at President Bush's 2006 national space policy, explicitly says that the U.S., you know, really is not going to get involved in any uh, new efforts to supplement or add to international space law. This obviously began to change during the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Uh, and this change continues right here during the, the Biden administration. Um, critical interest right, of the United States in strengthening global governance on space activities, working with its international allies at places like the United Nations to develop these norms, these rules, et cetera. And you can see right, this push towards global governance in the United States support of these efforts to develop norms and rules for responsible behavior in outer space. Further, right, this next one, the US will bolster space situational awareness sharing and space traffic coordination. Uh, right, you saw in the DOD uh, tenets of responsible space behavior, this importance of communication, data sharing, um, orbital ranges right between space objects 
And the U.S. has always uh, provided space situational awareness um, to to allies and even to you know potential international rivals to prevent on orbit collisions and things of that nature. And so the idea that the U.S. would continue to do this um, to bolster space situational awareness, space traffic management, certainly not a new idea, you know, but again a reemphasis on the U.S.'s commitment to preserving the space environment, preserving the safety of that environment, and preventing collisions, damage, harmful interference, and the additional creation of space debris. And then finally, interestingly, right, U.S. will prioritize space sustainability and planetary protection. Right? Space sustainability, perhaps not so far out of the realm um, of uh, you know, what would or wouldn't be surprising. Obviously, space sustainability ties in directly with the tenets of responsible behavior issued by the DOD, uh, ties into Article 9, etc. New emphasis on planetary protection, though, is kind of interesting. Um, not usually something that's mentioned very frequently in official US kind of policy documents like the NSPs or things like that. Planetary protection, um, generally speaking, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, is the protection of kind of the earth itself as a whole from threats from outer space. For instance, um, probably primarily uh, the threat of impact from an asteroid or meteor um, that threatens significant swaths of a particular area of the earth um, or something of that nature. So kind of an interesting uh, thing to add into the policy priorities here in the space priorities framework, but nevertheless, something that is very, very important and likely does not get enough attention um, officially, or at least hasn't in the past, um, kind of in US government sources. Now, finally, a recent, um, Kind of event that I think is is quite interesting, uh, which came out earlier this month, and I think was only uh, reported on finally this week. Um, the People's Republic of China on December sixth, right, so the beginning of the month, about three weeks ago, uh, filed a note verbal with uh, the United Nations, right, addressed to the Secretary General, complaining about the fact that their new uh, kind of core module, right, the one that they launched for the Chinese space station that is under construction, has had to make several orbital adjustments to avoid um, SpaceX Starlink satellites that were in close proximity to the space station core module. Right? And this, uh, this diplomatic note is framed in the language of Article 5, right, the responsibility uh, discussed in the Outer Space Treaty for a state to inform either other states or the Secretary General of the United Nations of um, potential threats to the data, uh, to the life or health of astronauts, right? Any activity in outer space that could constitute a danger to the life or health of astronauts. And uh, so the permanent mission of the PRC filed this note, citing the language of Article 5, also citing, right, Article 6's um, responsibility for international actors and states um, to bear international responsibility for the activities of their non-governmental entities, right? Again, drawing in that concept of the United States' responsibility to govern the actions of its commercial space actors like SpaceX. And just this morning, um, not this morning, for us per se yesterday, right? But uh, today, earlier today, um, Beijing time, right? Um, Mr. Li Zhangzhou, the uh, PRC's foreign ministry spokesperson actually gave a press conference where he was asked about uh, the diplomatic note and China's complaint about uh, Starlink satellites. I believe it was a Bloomberg uh, reporter who asked the question. Uh, and uh, this was uh, Mr. Zhao's response, right? According to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, state parties should bear uh, international responsibility for their national activities in outer space, um, and even those conducted by right, their private space companies. Uh, the comments you, right, the reporter mentioned, understate the fact that the safety of uh, the China space station and the astronauts was under threat, um, 
hype up the so-called China space debris threat, right? The reporter had mentioned um, previous uh, Chinese space activities that were alleged to have created space debris um, and misrepresent China's normal space activities in an attempt to deflect international attention. This is shifting the blame on the innocent by distorting concepts. But much more interesting were his continued comments, right? He continues on, I'd like to stress that guided by the vision of advancing the welfare of all humanity, China is committed to peaceful uses of outer space. Outer space is not a place beyond the reach of law. All countries should respect and uphold the international order in space based on international law and adopt a responsible attitude to protect the safety of in-orbit astronauts and the safety and steady operation of space facilities. China is ready to maintain communication and cooperation with all countries over this. Very, very interesting comments. Why? Because the diplomatic note, right, issued by China at the beginning of the month made no reference, right, to Article 9. Didn't really even discuss those issues of responsibility or responsible behavior that Mr. Zhao uh, seems to be mentioning right here in his comments today. So it's interesting, right, that you've seen kind of this development, not just in the Western spacefaring states, but also right by the Chinese and to some extent, right, the Russians as well, towards this emphasis on responsible behavior, right? Mr. Zhao's comments relating to adopting a responsible attitude seem very much in line with similar statements, right, issued by Western diplomats and politicians with respect to the concepts of responsible behavior that we've been discussing. And so this raises a number of very important questions, right? As you have these continued international pushes at the United Nations for the development of these norms, these principles, as you see this push towards developing kind of more firm concepts of responsible behavior, will we see greater international cooperation? Do the fact that, or does the fact that the interests of all countries um, seem to depend on the further development of these norms, will that push them, all of us, right, towards greater agreement on these concepts of responsible behavior? Very similar to the way in which, right, fears and threats during the 1960s, fears by both sides of the Cold War, right, the United States and the Soviet Union, ultimately resulted in both sides coming together to develop a firm, fixed legal framework for space. Very, very interesting, right? And it also raises the question of, right, when turnabout is fair play and other spacefaring states are accusing the United States or its allies of irresponsible behavior in space, how will we respond, right? How will other states define irresponsible behavior in the context of the United States and its allies, how will they respond to that? And how will we respond to their allegations? And most importantly of all, right, this critical question again, based on this broader recognition, right, that there are common risks associated with bad behavior in outer space, with irresponsible behavior in outer space, the creation of orbital debris, irresponsible state action, potential harmful interference, right, between states with respect to their state systems. Given this broader recognition, is that going to be sufficient to bring possibly competing states together for the creation of new rules and norms or for the expansion of existing ones? And so with that, um, that kind of brings us right from January of 2021 all the way right to today, right? December 29th of December, 2021, uh, kind of a year spanning year in review of some key space law issues. And so with that, uh, I'll leave you with a shameless plug, right? For our new US Spacecom Legal Conference of 2022, right? And so again, I mentioned the inaugural legal conference during my remarks earlier in the presentation. The second annual uh, US Spacecom Legal Conference is going to be held, um, fingers crossed, right, COVID circumstances permitting in person here at the US Air Force Academy from the 4th to the 6th of April uh, in 2022. 
Uh, please note, uh, for those of you who may have tuned into previous webinars, this is a very minor change from the previously announced five to seven April dates. The official dates of the conference are now the 4th to the 6th of April. And the theme of the conference, it should possibly come as no surprise, is responsible behavior in outer space. Okay? And so our intention is to bring together um, a number of space experts right, to speak uh, at keynotes and on panels that are largely devoted uh, and focused on kind of the Department of Defense's five tenets of responsible behavior. Okay. And so we very much hope uh, that you will be able to attend. Please expect the release of a registration form link uh, for those of you who are a part of our Litwork mailing list. And for those of you who are not, please um, go ahead and shoot a message into the chat or send me an email. Uh, you can email us at litwork at usafa.edu. But please expect the release of a link to a registration form for the conference in early to mid-January. Uh, and for those of you who are US military members or um, have a US security clearance, uh, the final day of the conference, uh, the 6th of April, will be a multi-hour classified briefing. The classification level has not yet been determined, but please um, hold out for further information on that. And with that, uh, my presentation has largely reached its conclusion. And so I will stop my sharing and answer any questions that you may have. All right, uh, we got a few minutes left here. I know we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanna make sure we get to the questions that are presented. Uh, but first I wanna thank uh, Major Grunert for that wonderful holiday gift to all of us, that recap of 2021, um, I personally found it quite fascinating. All right, we have a question from Mark Meyer. Uh, do we always need bad press or can we bring awareness of the long-term sustainability guidelines and the sustainable development goals to the political public before things happen? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that we can bring it to the political public before things happen. I think that there is certainly a recognition of the importance of um, the long-term sustainability guidelines and the SDGs uh, for people who are aware of space policy and certainly uh, with respect to um, those diplomats and other actors who are working those policies at the United Nations. Um, that said, to capture the interest of the wider public, um, unfortunately, there's nothing quite like bad press or a catastrophe to grab the public's attention. So do we always need it? No, we probably don't. Um, that said, I think as we've seen in recent years with uh, you know, the way that the mass media works, I, in order to really grab the attention of the news reading public, you need something that sounds scary at least for them to take a look. I'm not sure that we, would get a whole lot of traction bringing some of those things to the public with, for instance, a, an informational article that didn't include kind of the, uh, if it bleeds, it leads sort of thing, um, which honestly is quite sad. Um, and perhaps we don't necessarily need to rely on um, the wider public's support of such things. Um, that said, I mean, I think it would be preferable if we could uh, inform the wider public of the importance of these issues without those sorts of negative events or negative press occur. Right, and we have a question from Patrick Klancik, wondering what, if any, specific communications or dialogue have been initiated by the National Space Council with the broader DOD or private legal community following Kamala Harris's first National Space Council meeting and release of this year's space priorities framework, including the emphasis on responsible behavior in space? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. And unfortunately, I don't know the answer. Being here at um, USAFA uh, and not, uh, you know, kind of one of the key policymakers uh, in the space arena at the Pentagon or anything like that, I can't necessarily say whether or not any such communication has occurred. It may have, it may not have, um, but I can only expect um, or suspect perhaps that 
key, you know, DOD policymakers are, you know, uh, well well informed of um, the White House's space priorities and are in constant communication with key members of the Biden administration with respect to those priorities and with respect to the development of the DOD's tenets of responsible behavior and other activities that US Space Com and the new US Space Force are taking with respect to those critical issues. All right, and then finally a question from me, Jeremy. Uh, no end of the year recap um, would be complete without a prediction for the year ahead. Um, so when you look forward to 2022, uh, do you think this theme of exploring the responsible behaviors in outer space will continue to be the dominant kind of space law related theme of 2022? Or is there anything on the horizon that you think might um, uh, come up and, and, and challenge the primacy of that, of that theme going forward this year? Yeah, Jeff, I definitely do. I think that this emphasis on responsible behavior, this push towards whatever you want to call them, right, norms, rules, principles uh, of responsible behavior, I think will continue to be the dominant direction of at least kind of international space law and policy uh, debates. I think that everything, it, it, part of the reason for that is I think that a wide range of activities and behaviors feed into that concept of responsible behavior in such a way that it would almost be impossible for another issue to supplant it, right? Because so many things can fit within that responsible behavior framework, whether it's ASAT testing or um, the fears of a space arms race, uh, whether it's the creation of orbital debris, whether it's the preservation of the space environment, all of those things fit nicely into this concept of responsible behavior. So I do expect that to continue to be kind of the dominant discussion kind of in the international space law arena, not just because of uh, right, the continued emphasis on that in the UN and the you know, possible work of the open-ended working group that's going to uh, presumably right, be created uh, at some point in 2022 to examine the questions uh, raised in the UK's um, first committee resolution, uh, but also for all of the reasons right, that I elaborated. It's just a very broad-based um, concept that can encompass all sorts of activities and behaviors. All right, well, thank you, Major Gruner. Um, finally, let me uh, just say thank you to all of you out there. Um, I know that 2021 was not the greatest year for everyone. Um, but it was a pretty good year for the Law, Technology, and Warfare Research Cell, and that's uh, mostly because of all of your participation um, in the conferences and the webinars. Um, hopefully, this upcoming year will continue to see us grow, particularly um, in some of our other focus areas, such as cyber, artificial intelligence, and emerging technologies. Um, but I want to thank uh, Major Grunert in particular for all of his efforts this year, um, and for the Colonel Goins, um, our director as well. We hope to see all of you in the upcoming year at our webinars and particularly at um, our second annual U.S. Space Command Loop Conference, as Jeremy mentioned, hopefully here at the United States Air Force Academy, um, COVID permitting. So uh, happy holidays to everyone out there. And uh, Jeremy, I'll put it back over to you for any final words. Just final words to, to echo what Jeff said. Thank you all for attending this morning. Uh, I know that with the holiday season, the upcoming new year, uh, there are a lot of other things that you could be doing, and so I appreciate you um, attending this morning to listen to this presentation. I hope you have a happy and safe new year, and we look forward to continuing to see you at our events uh, in the upcoming year. Thank you.